This is the um, Joint Town Council and School Board Finance Meeting. Today is Monday, September 18th, um, and everybody is present other than Ruth Porter. Yes. So we have no old business. We'll go jump right to new business and debrief on FY18 budget. <laughs> The first um, topic under on our agenda is to sort of talk about what worked, um, what we think needs improvement, things we could change, um, any new ideas. So I open it up to anyone who wants to start. So I'll start with a positive. I like that. Yeah, Frida. Um, I, I do think um, one of the one of the things we heard less of this year, we didn't get completely eliminated. I don't know if we'll ever completely get eliminated, but it seemed like there weren't as many com uh, concerns or complaints about transparency because I think we had a lot of data out there. We had everything was open and available. Um, it wasn't completely eliminated. Of course, there are. I think there are always going to be people who want things done a certain way differently or want to present it a different way. But my impression this year versus others was that that was not as prevalent as we've heard in the past. So I think that was a positive. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> to add to that, I think that the work um, process uh, went studying what we well. It always improves the relationship between the two boards as well as the staff. Um, and then the work product that came out of the end, I thought was uh, extremely well thought of and uh, well discussed and uh, very open. I agree. I um, I guess I'll be the first negative Nelly of the group. Um, I agree with that statement, and I, I feel like it was a joint process throughout the entire um, time. It seems like we started a really long time ago, and um, <laughs> we did start a really long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and and I I did feel like it was collaborative. So <clears throat> I guess the negative part for me was not fully understanding when sort of. It came time for the budget to be presented and, and talked about to hear that it, it, there were others that didn't feel like it was collaborative. Because for me, I felt like we sat here as a group and talked candidly and, and asked leadership and staff to make choices and to go back. And then they came back and then we asked them to do more. And I felt like that was a collaborative effort with all of us. Can you, elaborate, can, can right. you elaborate on what you mean? Like when well, I heard, did you, did you hear that amongst, us? between our groups, or did you hear that from the public? No, I feel like from the public, but also from, there were, other, there were council members who yeah. felt like it wasn't collaborative. And, and I felt like that might have maybe been because they weren't here or part of that, but it was a collaborative effort, in, in my opinion. Now maybe I completely misread those meetings, but for me, I felt like we as a group came together, made decisions, asked leadership to do certain things, to make fine reductions in certain ways, and come back to us. Then we all talked about it. Are we good with that? We asked them to go back for more. And I, so I felt like that was a collaborative effort. And so then to hear that as an audience member sort of was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, throwing that out there and having the public not fully understand what has been happening apparently through our process was was sort of, I was taken aback. But I, I believe, and I still believe, that it was collaborative. I just don't know where the disconnect happened. It's kind of that balance between what you do in committee work where you dig deep and you, you have your folks at the table who have committed to be the experts on that topic, whether it be finance or ordinance or you know, policy, whatever committee it is, and then that balance between bringing it back to the larger group and having them come into the fold and understand what's been going on. Um, it's challenging for them to get to the same level that you've had yeah. by the, the <coughs> amount of time that you've spent. That's true. 
So, you know, one of the opportunities maybe as we talk about, because <clears throat> I think you put on here other things we can do around communications at different, and I think every year it's gotten better. I think communication still is kind of the Achilles heels for us, and there's lots of opportunities. And that, you know, I think to get to your point, Jody, I, I think we spent a ton, I mean, the documents that we had and all the, I thought this work was really collaborative. Um, I think when we then rolled it out, that's where we have an opportunity. How do we, how do we become more inclusive? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's something just to be aware of. And then two, the, the other thing that, around communication that I'd love to do is, and I think we started to do it a little bit, but every year I think our biggest Achilles heel is we have dueling numbers out there and everybody gets frustrated. I wish we could have a trusted place where someone can go and the numbers are clearly explained, what they are, what they're not, with some trusted source of doing it. So I think, you know, I, I, I don't think we'll get to all of it tonight, but I still think that communication piece is still an opportunity. I, I don't have the answers yeah. I think we should ask, but I think the communication piece. I feel like we posts. had one. We yeah. have can the you, trusted space. No, can you, What's the, that? The budget portal is yeah. the trusted material. Those are the numbers. Yeah. So, so I don't know why we would need like a third party. I, I'm not suggesting a third party. Just yeah, but just like I don't know if it's where else it could come from to be the trusted source besides from the town council and school board and joint well, finance. I think it should come from there, but I think you know how do we get people to go there to get the information? I think is, and then we I don't know. I mean, rather than trying to solve that, I'm just yeah. saying I think that. I, I, I guess from from my point, I'd ask for a little bit more clarity too. When you mean by inclus being more inclusive, uh, we were talking initially about including other counselors in the process. Are you talking about being more inclusive in reporting out and getting the general board and the general council aware and up to speed with what we're doing and the details of it and more comfortable with it? Or are you talking about more public inclusiveness? At this point, I was talking about it, as we were talking about the council members. Okay. Is really, I think, I think we did hear that from some council members, and I think a great thing to do, and I don't know if you heard it from some Board of Education members, maybe is just ask them, is there a, a one other step in the process that we could take that they they have a way to get some input and get educated, whatever it is, but I think it's worth exploring, because I think, I think you're right, that was. Right, so I guess my question, because I don't know how the council works, if it were a different committee, say it weren't finance, if it were, ordinance or policy or any of that, at what stage do other counselors have input in that before it's presented? Does that happen or? Yeah, so any stage. I mean, any, any counselor can come to any committee meeting and sit in if it's a topic that they're But interested. it's not any different than how our budget works. I don't believe so, not that I'm aware of. No, but more times than not, a committee will report <clears throat> or come forward with recommendations and that's often the first time the, right. the other counselors hear or see it. I think the difference is this is a, a big, complicated body of work. And I know from watching you work for months to get to that point, there were some tough choices, and it's kind of a package deal. And to have some things change at the last minute um, can be problematic. So I think kind of managing those expectations, telling other counselors or other board members if they want to be involved, speak to one of these sitting <laughs> council members on the committee or come to a committee meeting. And I think we started to address that and we, because we had ample opportunity. We had a joint workshop session between the full council and the full board and we started doing more inclusivity between the groups. I guess I would have thought that that was the appropriate venue and the appropriate time to start asking questions and not wait until we get so far down the process that we've already made some of those decisions yeah, no, no, no. and now we, now we have to, now we're being expected to go back and second guess that work that we did and go back and either justify what we, what we did and re-debate it again, open it up for debate again, or uh, you know, come up with something completely different that's going to have a, more of a ripple and more of an impact through the process. So, I mean, I guess maybe a solution, I don't know if it's more joint workshops right. together or That's if it's a better right. reporting yeah. out where we actually sit down and have a council reporting or a board reporting. You have a, a dedicated session to 10 minutes of here's where we're at, questions and answers. Right. But where are we at? You know, are we comfortable or not? If we are, okay, move on. And, and yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so maybe that, maybe that joint meeting that we had the full board and the full council happens earlier in the cycle. That's a good idea. Well, yeah. but remember, and that's not bad, but remember we're still we're still assembling right. data all the way up until the bitter end. I mean, yeah. we didn't have any Absolutely. Do we have a, a first joint session? 
Did we have that at the beginning? We changed it and reversed it. We used to have it at the end, and we reversed it last year because it was the recommendation from the year before, and we had that at the very beginning. So I think that if we, if we listen to the statement that was made, there's three issues that it's, it feels like a running danger from the question and back to school because each part of it has like these first In problems. 20 parts. Yeah. In 20 parts. So when you think about um, transparent uh, inclusiveness, there's two levels. There's inclusiveness of the council members right. and the school board, but then there's also the general public. Right. The only way that you can be 100% inclusive at this level is to guarantee that we all do all of our work with the full board and the full council. That solves the problem, is that every meeting we have about the budget is going to be both boards put together. That solves the problem. But I don't know if that's realistic. Right. Right. I'm, I'm just saying is that that's yes. the, that is the solution in order to guarantee inclusiveness so that a counselor or a school board member doesn't at the end sit there and say, I don't think it was collaborative and I wasn't given enough information. But, but these meetings open. are also posted. So if, if Donna wanted to show up and, and find out what's going on right. or be a part of it, She'd be sitting in the audience or sitting there and listening, and yeah, but she could be here. So I don't know having, I know you're just using that as an example, but I'm not sure having all of our joint meetings as both full board and council is productive. Um, so, Maybe. so I agree with you. I'm just saying is that's the solution in order to guarantee that no one is critical, well, no one that's elected that sits on these boards is critical at the end of the process because you're guaranteed because you're automatically invited to everything and that you're part of the, so it's a, I, and what we call it is a, it's a committee of the whole. Mm -hmm. It's in essence what it happens. And I personally don't think it's wrong. It just depends on who shows up to the meeting and they participate. Because we did have, I think Council Dunham showed up quite a few times, I think. Mm -hmm. Council Rowan was a few times. Rowan did it a few times, maybe different times. And maybe even Katie showed up, I think, once or twice. So they came in at certain different levels, but they weren't throughout the whole. So right. I'm just saying that that wasn't the solution. I, I think that's that's certainly a solution to that, that could be approached. I, you know, maybe it's just a question of managing expectations of the individual governing bodies a little bit better. And discussing, you know, part of our, our kickoff workshop as we get together and set I think goals right. needs to be, here's, we have a, we have a committee process in place, and this happens to be a very important one and does a lot of the heavy lifting, but there's a process in place for that. So, I, I mean, I guess if, if you're not part of that committee, you have the option of engaging, but maybe it is a question of reporting out more. I think, the, I think it becomes almost too cumbersome if everything, if, if we got full board, full council on every decision. And I'm not, I'm not saying you're, you're advocating, I'm just saying that, you know, we're trying to figure out what a good solution to that might be. Maybe it is managing expectations of the individual groups better. I don't know. And, and the joint meeting didn't, didn't happen at the beginning. I mean, it happened <laughs> comparatively no, right. later. Yeah, it, it was towards the end of all the work because we were talking about reductions at that, um, like a second or third round of your reductions at that meeting because I remember talking about what does that mean if we lose a grandparent eight corners. Right. Um, so that was toward the end of the beginning, I guess. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it may be as simple as your suggestion is saying is there'll be a new town council that convenes. And if they go through that process of setting goals and how we want to work together, that would be a great place to discuss it before the finance committee kicks off its work for the budget. Mm -hmm. May want to check back with the full council and kind of say, what is it? What are your expectations to get to your point? Mm -hmm. And that and that may have changed some of the dynamics. Because um, every time we have, I mean, I can just say the first time, the first year is like drinking through a fire hose. There's a right. lot of things happening. Right. There's a lot of maybe unstated expectations. And so I think your point is, I think we can do a better job of setting it. it every council is going to be different. So how do we get that work done up front, find out how the council wants to work next year, and then just kind of put whatever we need in place to make that, make that work. And I think one of our goals was to try and cod codify this process as right. best we could so that, that it's not just based on personalities and desires to do it from one year to the next right. well, and build that into the process a little bit. And to your point, Peter, too, what you're saying when you're a new counselor, I think it, I, in my opinion, it would be a mistake to have every finance meeting be joint for the council, yeah, because right. at least speaking from the school board side, like we live the committee process. Like you're on your committees, you report out. If you have questions, you go to that that chair. So the expectation for a new school board member is like, okay, you're going to have all the school board meetings. You're going to be on at least two committees. You're going to be a liaison to something, and also you have to go to every finance meeting. That's kind of an unrealistic, and I think we burn out a lot of people no, no, real yeah, fast. No, I don't think that. 
Yeah, but, so. but, but, but I think kind of a combination. I just think, you know, we should codify whatever the process, because I think yeah. the process has worked, as we just described how this group has worked, the Joint Finance Committee. I think that work should continue. It's this, that check-in process to the next, that's where we got the feedback from. Just ask our peers at the very beginning, how do you want to work? This is, that will work or won't work, or if it's just one extra step. But I, yeah, but, but I don't think it's the whole thing. Yeah, and so I, I brought that as an outlier kind of yeah, position. Yeah, and, the and the reason is that if, if, since we won't do that and can't do that, and we also have to then change some of the variables that go into that and or go into the entire process. And I don't remember what, I think it was actually Kate that brought it up, and that is that I think the council has a hard time in relying on the expertise of committee members um, in certain areas so that when something comes to the floor, you should be able to have, and for governance, the purpose of committees is to become the expert. You, you dive into the data, and you have to be able to communicate out where that is. And what happens in the budget process is that when we, when we, and it was unanimous, our budget on finance, but then individuals who weren't part of the process said, well, I want to change this, 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 and this, and didn't rely on the recommendation that we had. And relatively speaking, it was minor because those changes focused around three, you know, those three changes that we made at the end, three or four changes that dealt with the beach cleaning. So they were minor in comparison to the big picture. So, which then, of course, then led, after that, when it didn't pass, it led to the criticism of, well, it wasn't collaborative, and now we're in this position. Because we, I think we tend to beat up on ourselves when we're not successful a little bit too much. So, you know, how do we get our board, the council in particular, you know, individual members to be confident that the work was done thoughtfully and, and to minimize kind of the opportunity for any criticism. I, mean, I do think it is a two-way street. I, I mean, I do think that there has to be trust of the individual members. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that it's not there, but I, I think there has to be trust of the individual members to trust the committee process, and, and equally there has to be a, 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 a better way of communicating what we're doing and the details of what we're doing. So maybe that is part of it. We always talked about consular orientation and bringing people on first time people and kind of setting not just their expectations because obviously they have goals and needs that they're or approaches they're coming in with, but we should have expectations as a collective governing body through policies and procedures that say this is how we do things. You know, this is what we've kind of agreed to. It's what's worked in the past. It's not perfect, clearly. But you know, we're not gonna necessarily reset the clock every single year because the work's too complicated and it's too messy to do that every single year. So and we had talked about sort of having that conversation maybe as a larger group. And because to toot our own horn, I feel like we do a good job of, of onboarding someone and saying, this is, if you have questions on X, this is, this is how it goes. Mm -hmm. And in, instead of always going to the chair for something, if she's not on the finance committee, it doesn't make sense to go to the chair and then to come to me and then to come around. So there's a clear line of if you have a question on this, here's where it goes. Or if someone emails us a question from the, the citizens, emails a question on finance, I would probably be the one to respond, or, or Kelly would, but Kelly and I would have that conversation to be like, do you want me to respond? But we have a procedure in place on how we handle all of that. And so it becomes very clear for new members how it works. Because when you get a ton of emails, you're like, we could learn from that. Am I supposed to be, oh, do we all respond? How do, like, how do we handle this? And when I first started, we did all like respond. So it's just like, thank you again for your email. And like, you get seven of those as the citizen. It doesn't make sense. So we've streamlined that over the last three or four years to make it very clear on what has to happen by then. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Good, good talk, Ben. Good contribution, buddy. Um, so I think I think there Denver's are ways, or maybe it's Tom and Julie just sort of talking to let you guys know, or, or Sean and Kelly, or something, just to sort. Of, and there may be things that you guys do that we should be taking into account, just so when we're all talking, we're we're talking the same language and, and have the same expectations of how it will work. I mean, I think that's, that's a fair cool. takeaway for us to kind of. You know, do our own internal. We the, the, they have a great model on how they do stuff. I mean, we could we could learn from that. So well, I, I participated for a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, don't so. wanna, I don't want to walk the process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. They fixed so, everything that I did. We're doing the same thing in a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think I think.
there is the internal communication piece you're talking about. And I think there's some things we can do to kind of, you know, before the next season, which is going to be upon us soon, to kind of stream. Then I think any thoughts about external communication, things that could be done differently, should be done differently. So that goes into the second part of that Brian Dangerfield kind of reference. I mean, that is that you talked about um, there were multiple numbers from different sources. Um, I, I agree, you know, that we had one source. But how people take that information off and then interpret it in their own, is there's nothing we can do to change that. No, no, but my, my thought was, I think at one point we had a vision is almost, um, is there a way we could have, you know, a, a, you know, a town sponsored sort of place people could go for like frequently asked questions. So there would be an opportunity to say, this number in this context means this, this number in that context means something different. Where we get to is both sides or, or both, you know, we're saying the other one's misinformation and misleading. That doesn't help create the environment we want in our community. So how do we... But is that a direct result of our process being flawed or how no. people are interpreting that data? Because I feel like we have a budget portal. We have the, open, we have the, we had the, the, the forum there where we, you can come and ask questions that you know, we were constantly struggling of is it effective or not. We had the, the community forum. Yep. And then we had the, we, we, did, we did a couple of one pagers that we tried to condense everything down to the simplest forms. Yep. We had all the backup data there for anybody that wanted to dive into it. And then we also had that running list of questions that we always have every year that we keep adding to and keep, you know, yep. keep responding to. So I, I'm at a loss to, to really figure out what else is there. I mean, other than, other than, I mean, we, we, I think collectively as a group, we decided on what figures we were going to use. We set our goals for the year, both yeah, as a council yeah. and as a joint group, and, and we worked hard to achieve those goals. We didn't get it right the first time, obviously, because we felt like we could make an adjustment because it was a reasonable adjustment. We all came collectively to that decision. I think it was the right thing to do. The town didn't agree, and they let us know, and we moved on. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of struggling with, with, I keep hearing that word a lot, transparency, and better data and agreeing to numbers, I don't think that's our issue. I, I, I don't see that as, I'm having a hard time seeing that as our issue because I think we've looked at it to the point where we put our data out there and if other people interpret it, we have two choices. We can collectively sit back and say, I'm sorry, this is inaccurate, this is how we want it to go, or we can sit back and say, you know what, that's your interpretation. We're making our decisions and setting our policy based on this information because this is what we've agreed to. Well, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't have the solution, but the, the concept was I know, Larissa, on sort of the Facebook page, I know there are times when there's issues that come up that there's been some back and forth between, you know, people that are in the general public might ask a question or get confused. And so, the, the, Chris, I hear you, the, the stuff we put out there is static. Mm -hmm. We put it out there and those frequently asked questions are static. Mm -hmm. This is just, is there a mechanism when we see that there's some confusion maybe in the community around what the numbers are or the issues are, could is it should we create some type of feedback mechanism that we can then try to clarify so that it's not static, it's actually in the moment. And that, that's only an enhancement. It doesn't necessarily mean change the whole process. Right. But you know, as things come up, and I, I and I and I hear what you're saying, and I yeah. I, I don't disagree that that was that's been a problem. Yeah. But I, I guess my question is is don't we already have a process in place for that? You we can get emails or phone calls anytime, every time of asking questions. Tom gets emails asking for clarity on on any number of things. So I don't think it's just a static process where we throw this wall up and we say here's our data, throw it, see what sticks, and then we walk okay. away. And I and I think it's I do think that there is a certain amount of responsibility on the general public side to inquire for the right questions and ask that kind of information. If they, if they don't understand what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it, they can ask those clarifying questions. It's something completely different to simply say, I don't like your decisions, I don't like your numbers, I want them changed. That's a different discussion, right? Or, or, or are you talking about how do we incorporate that into the mechanism? I think what I was referring to in the, in the last couple of years, we've had, you know, I mean, we've had two different signs up at election time that have different numbers on, them. and our response collectively has been, well, those numbers aren't right, and the issue becomes, 
you know, within the context they're being used, they may or may not be right. But the is, point is they weren't used in context. That's well, what makes it. Well, well, well so is there a way, but, but how do we, how can you? You can't. You can't, how do you regulate I, you that can't. as a political side? I mean, it's not like, I would agree with you, if we were putting billboards up or we were no, advertising but, saying, here's our numbers, these are the right numbers, and these are the only numbers, I don't think we can, it's, it's, it, I don't know how as a governing body we can influence political thought. Nor should we. I'm not trying to. You know what I mean? So, so if we put the data out there, right? It's like I said. If we if we put a number up there, um, and we say let's say it's five percent increase, okay? We all collectively said this five percent. We're basing our policy on this. This is the decision we made. This is what we think it's going to be. Okay? We put that out there. If another group says, well, uh, it's not really five percent. I'm looking down at this and I'm interpreting it this way and saying it's actually five point five percent. That's their prerogative. We can have two choices. We can, we can refute that and say, that's not entirely accurate because your math doesn't line up. Or we can simply say, these are the numbers that we use to base our decisions on. That wasn't part of the decision making process. Yeah, I guess, I guess where I was in, in, in sort of your point about context, what we could do is provide context to what the numbers are. I mean, the, the problem is, I think there's a lot of confusion remains in the community about what were the numbers, what did they mean. But and I don't so, think we created that confusion. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, that was I, I'm on not, us at no, all. No, I'm not saying that we created, I'm just saying when we well, see we that. Well, we were told we were created, I mean, we've been called some pretty nasty things over the last well, six months. Well, all I'm trying to say is when we, if we're sitting here and seeing something like that, do we want to have any role in trying to put something out that says, hey, you know, here's here's an explanation. This is where it is. We spent our time. Well, I mean, I, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, I that's just, that's I just, I think the school board's good. Facebook page is covered with. Here's what you're seeing on signs. Here's, here's what, that where, means. what that number means, yeah. and here's what you know, what we're I showing you. Create context. So, yeah. I, yeah, yeah I, 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 okay. I, I, I just, we're, we're, I mean, I don't have the. Uh, what we're trying to say is, we try to identify where do we have stumbling blocks every year to the process. We and have that's stumbling blocks where the largest percentage is. If you want me to be very honest with you, whatever the largest percentage is on that sheet, that's going to go on the sign. Sorry, I'm saying it. It's true. Every year that's what's happened the last three years. What's the largest percentage? Okay, we're putting that on there. I, I it has no it. context. So my point to the other side or to whoever wants to put something out there, you can put whatever you want on the sign because it doesn't have any context whatsoever. So if you can be okay with creating that sign, have at it. Well, I'm not going to create I, that I think, sign. I think, to your, to your, to your question, to your answer, look, I think our responsibility is, is personally, this is just my personal opinion, I don't think our responsibility is to sort out who's accurate and who's not accurate. I think our responsibility is to explain how we're making our decisions, identify the data that we're using, what parameters we're using and why we're using it, and be able to justify those decisions based on either expert opinion or or a hunch or whatever it is or a magic eight ball if we use a magic eight ball. But we have to at least explain that to the general populace of what we're doing and why. And I think at that point, you know, the, there's going to be debate and there's going to be discussion out there, and certainly we're going to get feedback from that stuff. And I think we deal with that on an individual basis as it comes. But I, I that's why I struggle. I struggle with the fact that, you know. It's one thing if we're using a flawed auditing system, let's say, okay, or a system that we know is not, it's not approved, or it's something that we're doing that's, that's questionable. I don't see that in the process. What I see is disagreement on what the outcome needs to be. And that's okay, and that's, that's a good, healthy debate to have. But when we start getting into whose numbers are right and who's not, I don't think that's our role. I think our role is to say, we, we made that decision because you know, we, set, we set our goals to tax rate. Yeah, right. no, I was I was just trying to, if we could envision, you know, a trusted place, which is the portal we'll try to create, the budget mm -hmm. portal, mm -hmm. that there could be sort of, you know, when there's confusion around things, not who's right, who's wrong, but try to bring some clarity to the conversation. Some that's all I'm suggesting. Did, so did, some process. So. But we didn't do that this year. You don't. You don't so feel like we did that this I year. Like I, could, I feel like I could offer some insight, be, being that this was my first time going through this process, and I obviously learned a lot. Um, to me, the the one thing that I think we have to focus on the most is how do we gain more trust in our community? Yeah. Because the fact that we would even think that the town's website 
that contains the budget portal somehow doesn't have trusted information says a lot about what the real issue is. So for me, it's how are we going to garner more trust from our constituents? And you know, I think what was confusing for me was all along I kept hearing that the council goal was 3% or less in terms of the tax rate. And then very quickly the narrative became about something other than the council's goal. And then it became all of us reacting to different opinions and different perspectives about things that were not our goals. So I feel like we got really distracted by and, and pulled away from what is it that we said we were going to do, how do we go about communicating that, and instead it was like this reactionary always trying to defend some piece of isolated information that was put out there. And so we have a very complex budget. There's X number of departments in the town. Um, the school is one of those departments. And yes, it's the majority of the town's budget, as it is in every single town in America. Um, and so I think that getting really crystal clear about what the goals are, and then really clear about how, like what are those values, what are those collective beliefs that we share as a community that's going to help us get to that goal, and always checking back to those things is going to create, a, a hopefully, I think, would create a better budget process as a whole. Um, I do think that we could refine our meeting schedule a bit. I don't think adding more meetings is necessary. I feel like we had many meetings. Um, but maybe being more strategic about what the topics are or what the scope and sequence is at those meetings so that we can hone in on different aspects of the budget um, and get really a deep understanding and have really clear conversations about you know, the transportation parts of each budget across the town and then the personnel parts of each budget across the town. So I feel like we had a lot of meetings about communicating and then that didn't really work. So let's not repeat that same process again. And we also had a lot of meetings before we actually got into the meat and potatoes of the budget. So I felt as a newcomer to the team that um, I didn't really know exactly like where we were headed for much of the process. So um, I would appreciate getting really clear about what our goal is in the very beginning and maybe possibly considering how do we get input from the community in the goal setting part? Because if we are setting a goal, but we don't have collective commitment, then no matter how well we hit that goal, we're going to be in the same place we were this year. So maybe it's thinking about um, a way to get some input on the goal development itself. And you know, when I hear that our goal was 3% or less, and I look back four or five years, we've hit that goal. We've hit 3% or less. Actually, it's been or less all of those years. Um, and so now that we're hitting that goal, it seems like the target is moving for some people to something else. But did, are we deciding that, or are we letting special interest groups decide that the target's miss moving? Uh, that's kind of a question that I have. Um, and I think the other thing is really being clear about what is the communication plan, how as we're as we're mapping out maybe how we're going to dig deep into the budget so that the town can really understand, our community can really understand all the various aspects of the budget, then how are we going to follow up and repeat that message in the following day, week, you know, month, so that we're beating the drum and we're making it really clear what's in this budget and why it's in the budget. And it should always come back to because it's part of our long range plan or because it aligns to our values or because it's based on the needs that are before us. And I think when we can keep coming back to that, I felt like constantly reacting. Like every day I was like wincing to open my email to see what, you know, mini research project was I going to have today. And that's exactly the point I was just going to make. The amount of staff hours spent on providing information that already exists in the portal and just rephrasing that or rewriting it for other people. It's crazy to me. It has to. Like it has to stop. It has it's, to it's just be acceptable. A link to the portal. Link to the portal. And if you have a clarifying question that can be answered in two or three sentences, fine. But it can't be wild goose chases. It can't be. I have this other idea of a system of government. I want you to research for me. And um, this is the way you should do it. That's not. That's not the way our town works. That's mm -hmm. not how we can spend our human resources. And it. I mean, literally, I feel like that's all. 
we were able to do all summer. Definitely as a school board, we absolutely got nothing else done from about April to maybe we're just starting up again now because it was constant like hammering, like refining, refining. And I'm not saying that we didn't need to do that because we clearly did, the budget was not passing. But like exactly that, the research projects and trying to find new and exciting ways to say the numbers over and over again, it was just exhausting. And so I really encourage everyone to just link to the portal, link to the portal, have everything in it, because it's not a good use of time, and it's mm -hmm. not fair to the people that need to be doing other stuff. If I could circle back around to something that you had mentioned before about um, you know, being more concise and maybe coming up with a good communication plan and not having to react to everything, I think the challenge that we face every year is that, uh, and we're looking, I think we're experiencing this too with our attempt to forecast. You know, there's a fairly, and Kate does this as well, there's a pretty good chunk of our expenditure budget that we can predict fairly well. Um, I, I think there's, it's not all 100% predictable, um, but there are so many different intangibles that keep getting thrown at us year after year. And I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but that's the reality of the process, is oftentimes we're being forced to make decisions and set policies with in, in, uh, inefficient information. You know, for example, we just uh, I heard coming in today that now the state's thinking of uh, forcing towns to pay for CDS services now. Okay, so By you know what? Right, so that's another several yeah. seven figure probably hit to our budget. How do you plan for something like that? Do we do we do we sit? I'm sorry. Do we sit there right now and go? This is on the radar. Let's ex let's expend resources and time and effort and energy to figure out what that could do. You know, or do we say, you know what, it may come out to something in a different form. We don't know what it's going to be. Do we wait and see what happens and then react to it or do a combination? So I think it's very, so I think it's very, very difficult to, to sit down like a business or a company and say, we know we want to hit X number of widgets by the end of the year. We're going to keep tweaking our processes to get to that point because our processes are constantly in flux. And so when we, there's two scenarios there. You forecast for it, you plan for it, then the narrative on the street is, holy cow, their, right. inc their increase is 7%. You don't plan for it, the narrative on the street is, oh, there's this big thing that they're hiding from you. W the trust is a two-way street in my right. book, and so to create this environment that we're sneaky or that we're doing things yeah. underhandedly is, is absolutely a disservice, not only to our students who don't get a voice, or it, the whole entire community, the business community, people don't come here if they know that this is the attitude of this town. But I so think, we're but, damned if we do, we right. damned if but we I don't. I, but I think, again, I think that was more to, to, to Julie's point as well, is that the people we're going to, we're never going to please the special interests. So we, I think collectively, and that's kind of the point I was trying to get to earlier when, when, with, with Peter, is that if our processes are sound and our logic is, is, is reasonable, I, I think we have a better time justifying. I mean, people are going to say what they're going to say. They're going to say it no matter what. And 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 you know, like 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 you were saying before, they're going to pick the highest percentage no matter what it is. You know, uh, plates at the cafeteria went up twenty-seven percent. Oh, look at that. That's a problem. You know, so we're we're, we're always going to have that but white that, noise in the background. But that, that creates that, the lack of trust. But it's I think all a big but, vicious cycle because it becomes this thing that we're doing something sneaky. Or. But if we're constantly reacting to that, I think if we're constantly reacting to I that, agree. then we're we're feeding into that. Look, yes. clearly there's something wrong here because look at the way everybody's running around trying to react to it. I, I think if we agree. if we get a good process in place and we agree to the numbers and we do our metrics and we stick to those. You know, uh, then I think it's much easier for us to sit back and say, it's not no longer a question about whose numbers are right. Now it's the philosophical question of which direction is the town going? Do we want the town to look like this, or do we want the town to look like that? And that's a completely different discussion than I don't like your budget number this year. But, but isn't that what we did this year? Yes. I thought we did. Right. We had a, everyone on this table, I think, agrees that it was a sound, good process, mm -hmm. and we had an articulable goal that. I think was clearly understood that yeah. that was reasonable. That's that's based in some reality. Uh, yet we have the same outcome, right? Because I think I think to to, to Jody's process, we got sucked into that whole narrative. Well, of we, but, uh, 
that's just this year. This is a recent phenomenon. I don't think so. I think that's happened like every year so far. We've had one year in the past five. I don't know that's what I call the signage and kind of the, 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 it's been different over the last couple of budget cycles, but the, the norm in this town is for us struggling to get the school budget passed. It's been that way since 2008. And we're- since 1979. Pardon? I yeah. heard it's been that way since 1970. Yeah. Well, actually, 16 <laughs> years, I think, is when was 2008 is when they started first <laughs> thing was budget. Was and you have to ask yourself, why Scarborough? Because I'm not aware of a community that does more by way of budget preparation, mm -hmm. by kind of transparency of process, by provision of information. Uh, I think it's the, it's it's the trust factor. It is I really do, because right. almost every one of those budgets, if you look back and we can research the votes, they've been unanimous votes on council or maybe a dissenter, but um, everyone's felt good about that product they put out to their voters, and more times than not, the voters turn it down. So you've identified that problem. What's the solution then? Do we, do we modify our processes in order to try and cater to, to a, a, a diverse group of opinions out there? Or do we stick, stick to our processes if we know they're good processes and just keep you know, persevering and saying it's a good process, we, we've got to stick to it because ultimately it's in the best interest of the town long term for us to do it this way. I mean, uh, that's kind of what we're trying to figure out, right? No, no, I don't have the answers, believe me. I've been part of this right the, along. Not just sticking to the process, but sticking to the values. Uh, you know, the stated goals of the council, the stated goals of the school board. Do we want to have high quality schools? Like, it's sticking to those values instead of the process because the process could result in 14 different things, but I think it's more important to stick to the values of each of the groups in the town as a whole. But to go back to what started this, Peter, you said about the messages, those two messages out there, you need to keep in mind is that the context of both messages were very, very different. They weren't yeah, the same at all. One right. talked about right. the tax, at least at the beginning, one talked yeah, about the no, overall tax rate, the other one talked about the civil spending. Right. Totally so right. even if we criticize ourselves for not sticking to our own values and sticking to our goal, which was less than 3%, because the first budget passed, we knew it was going to be 3.25. So yeah, we can criticize ourselves for not being at 3. But the second budget, we got it below three, and it still wasn't. And I, so I think the problem is not process; the problem is cultural, mm -hmm. and that there is there is a um, educational component. This is about educational spending because people out there are saying, "We don't want you cutting any services, even if it's twenty thousand dollars for beach cleaning or whatever it was. Um, we want you to cut educational spending." But, but that's, that's who was voting in this election. Right. But we at the table understand. understand the educational spending was still less than 3%. I, 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 I'm not debating the numbers. I'm just saying is that it's, I think the core of this problem isn't the number because if the number overall out of the bat was less than 3%, it still wouldn't have passed because of the focus on reduced spending for education. Well, we I know think that because people stood up at yeah. the podium and said you need to tell the Board of Ed to get their spending under 3%, and our spending is under 3%. So the fact that that's not even a, a no good enough. Right, like it just it it highlights that that's the issue. Well, well I, I think it. I think what it does is it highlights that again with twenty thousand people in town, and we see the same individuals on both sides up at the podium year in and year out. I don't know if that's an accurate representation of mm -hmm. the what this town really wants to do. So I think. Personally, I think maybe our time would be better spent trying to hit that reasonable, I call it the reasonable 80% in the middle, right? Because this 80% who maybe by not engaging, there's two ways to look at it. If they don't show up and vote because they think everything's great, you know, they, they don't have a concern, they don't have an issue, they, don't, they think everything's fine. And then you've got the 10% on each side of any issue that are usually the most vocal. And those guys, are the, those people are the ones that seem to be driving this process and derailing this process. So I think collectively, our, that's where we've got to come up and decide, do we want to move to the extremes and try and de defend our positions? Or do we want to try and stick to the middle and say, this is our plan. We're, we're, we are making improvements with metrics and forecasting as best we can. We're taking those, those, those financial responsibilities very seriously and we're acting appropriately. And then let the discussion be about philosophy. Because again, at the end of the day, that's not a bad discussion to have. I'm not saying we don't have it. But that's the discussion for the budget three years from now and four years from now. That's what we should be having this discussion. Not every single year, year in and year out, when it comes time to June to vote on a budget. That should be kind of already set. 
those kind of, you know what, you, you, you follow what I'm saying? We should be talking about, okay, this budget's done, how do we change it in three years? How do we change it in five years? If we don't like the direction that the town's going in, you know, do you put different candidates up and run for an office? Do you well, yeah. organize? Do the you accurate representation of the town's values is who got elected to the town council and who got elected to the school mm -hmm. board. And then who hired the staff right. that are guiding us and providing leadership. That's what is the accurate representation. Yeah. Who's sitting in seats. And you can argue all you want that there's a bigger represent like bigger groups out there. They didn't sign up to run or they didn't get elected. So here's the accurate representation. The seven people that sit in those chairs. I mean, think about it. With the discontent, presumably, I don't really believe there's that much of discontent in Scarborough. Yeah. There are six people running for town council, five of them are former councilors. Only one new person is running. Yeah. Yeah. But yet with the criticism that we've received this past year. You would think that there'd be twenty thousand people lining up. Yeah. I know, uh, but I, but so I, again, maybe it's it's important to put that into perspective and couch that when we have these discussions of how do we how we're responding and how we're reacting to it. Why would you run if you could get a reaction from everyone without running? That's true. It'll work. It'll work. Way less work. You know, I think so. It sounds like there's a lot of energy for <laughs> where we are and. Not sure we're going to solve it tonight. I, I, you know, I will say there's, I think there's parts of our process that are very good, but you've also got to look at outcomes. And I, I loved, I think, Julie's suggestion, I think, made a lot of sense. As she came in and looked at it, if we could become clear about goals up front, if our goal becomes we want to pass the budget on the first pass, not the third pass, you know, have some thoughts at the very beginning of the process. What do we need to do to get there? And you know, however we get that input, However, we get people to buy on. I think that's that's a worthy suggestion to think about at least this next time through. That's I, I appreciate. I'm it. assuming we didn't put that as a no, goal for next that was year. Not right? Pass on the first time. We didn't have that as a goal this year. No, no. But I'm saying I, I, I was using that as an example that right. if we I came together that, at the beginning of the process yeah. and said so vote to get to yes. That is a problem I have with that, and I know that's not what you're saying, but that's what, what sometimes feels like to me. Like, what do we do need to do to get to yes? Well, we could slash our budgets. That would. Hugely. I don't think it would. Would. Yes. No, I, I think that uh, I think Peter was just giving that as a hypothetical. I know, example. I know, but I but it just goes back to my. We need to stand by our values and know that we have an honest process, and that we are trying. Like I, I have a problem with the. What do we like at all costs? We want to pass them the first time. Like obviously, this summer was horrible. Nobody wants to keep doing it, but we have to also stand by the goals, but that's our vision and our values. But I think that being clear, if 3% if a tax rate that's 3% or less is our goal, or at or around 3%, I think is how I heard it originally. And Tom says to me, as the school department, that means you need to come in at X percent, and I then and we talk about that in a public way, and he says to the other departments, that means you need to come in around at these percents. That's what he does do with us anyways as departments in the town. And I think just being more transparent up front in that goal setting process, and maybe if it's on the school board agenda and it's on the town council agenda before we get deep into the budget process, because then we do make tough decisions. And if, if meeting those goals becomes our target, then we can talk about, okay, now we're at that goal. If there is political will to go up to X percent or to increase in a marginal way, this is what service that would bring to the town. This is what service that would bring to our students. So, so a couple of things. I mean, I think we do that. Think I thought we did a pretty good job of setting our goals ahead of time, and we communicated that very clear, certainly in this group, um, to, 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 to the two of you in terms of where we sat there and said, okay, a couple times we said, okay, where do we need to be to be at this percent? And it was less than three. Mm -hmm. My concern, my concern is the, the, the need to be flexible, fle more flexible in a static environment. Mm -hmm. Because if we just come out and say, it's 3% across the board, I'm just using it as an arbitrary number. If we say no more than 3% on the tax rate, that could mean public service doesn't increase anything this year, and the schools might have to go up four and a half percent, or vice versa. Maybe the schools only go up two percent, and public service needs to go up four and a half percent for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So we're, it's not going to change the, the the narrative, I don't think at all. I think what it's really going to do is it's it's going to set a potentially unrealistic expectation that every single department cannot exceed this level because that's what the goal is. So 
Period. That's the that's the hard stop. And I don't know if that's I don't know if that's reasonable or not. But it's where the conversation starts that matters greatly. I mean, mm -hmm. think when we roll the budget out, there's gets it grabs the headline, and that headline carries for two months. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't report as you're doing all your committee work, and so where that where that conversation, how that first story is written. But I feel like but that first story, that people were like, people got to the point and were like. This seems like a solid budget. This seems great. We're happy with the three and a half percent. Like I remember sitting there going, right. "Wow, yeah, this the seems crazy." Smoothest rollover yeah, ever had. This past year, probably notwithstanding, um, right. in the past, it's really mattered because the budgets have started really high, and we've been in a much different place. But there's been a lot of acrimony in those months in between. Oh, of course, and because we came out of the gate with a with a balanced approach to it and a good budget, mm -hmm. it shifted the other arguments and it focused on the individual components right. getting to what Chris was mentioning and that is that you know there are people in this town that would rather see the fire department get all of the increased spending versus the police department or versus education. Some in this town say it's all about education and the other um, program should stay flat. The thing that we're missing is that we're not talking at, through this process about future investment. Right. We're, what is it that we're trying to achieve and where do we want to take it because that should drive the spending pattern um, and any forecasting. But then again, you know, back to the whole process, you know, we had that finance committee meeting, Peter, when, you know, we, you would ask for the, you know, the uh, facilities plan as far as the projects and the debt service and the impact. And the assistant manager said, not only on the document, and he wrote it on the document, but said publicly, this is not a priority list, there is no preference given, it's just simply one snapshot in time. And one of the first comments that came out of a citizen was, I can't believe you're waiting 10 years before we can have a community center. <laughs> But yet, we hadn't talked about any priority, we hadn't talked about anything, so no matter what we do and the information that we share, it's going to be, the focus is going to get redirected once it is received by other people. People told me that we were building a new school, so I thought we were going yeah. to. I had no idea. And I, I think it's a, important to appreciate the difference between the school budget and the town budget. My typical approach to budgeting is try to deliver a budget that meets your expectations in day one. And then I'll provide to you as part of that there's some other investments I wish I could have made, and I'd like to talk to you about That's over the next several yeah. months. And That's always worked. More times than not, uh, certainly those discussions occur, and on many occasions you've found a way to do that. I don't think it's as simple as uh, doing that on the school side. It's clearly not, because I think if you're looking, I mean, that's a, that's a double-edged sword, to be honest with you, because you can look at, if we're going to do benchmarking with other communities, you can look at the percentages of, of, of our revenue that we spend on municipal services versus education and look at the disparity differences between 56 percent for education versus 60 or 70 in some other town so to say that you deliver the budget exactly where we want it that's that's a good starting point and we know that but if we're going to be looking at this collectively I think that conversation has to be the total budget like we talked about before that's the one town one budget so instead of instead of keeping that focus of well the town does this and the school does this I think if we get nothing out of this process, it should be the budget is one budget that's presented moving forward. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just trying to speak to my earlier comment, which is where you start matters. And I, mm -hmm. I was acknowledging the town has an easier way. Um, yeah. It's easier for us to start at, at a different place. There's well, just a lot of big numbers that are unknown for the school. And I think, too, that as our Department of Ed is getting regrouped and reorganized there's I just learned of three new massive initiatives on Friday one being the child development services that are currently state funded that are being shifted to the local level possibly possibly um, but also with that the conversation of pre-k and I learned that 70 percent of the um, districts in Maine currently offer pre-k preschool services and we haven't even been able to begin that conversation um, that's a major, a major thing that's going to come down the pike, and it's not something you snap your fingers and you make happen. Um, when, so we need to be able to see these things coming our way and being able to follow the trends in education and be able to respond. And if year after year, it's like this year, and we're ending below level services, those gaps are just going to become wider to fill. And before long, they're going to become mandates. And those that's when we don't have a choice, like proficiency-based education this year. That's why we needed supplemental services to get ready in order to implement that law this year, because we're like just towing the line with, with some of these changes. Um, another thing that's coming is career technical education offerings for middle school students. That's a huge shift. 
Right now we only offer it to our juniors and seniors and we partner with Paths and Westbrook to do that. So you're talking about some big shifts in education and I think that we want to be in a place where we're able to be responsive and you know I said this to our leadership team every time we talked about the budget. FY18 should be a step towards our vision. So we have this long-term vision of where we need to where we know we need to go and we're trying to just take a step closer each year of the budget. Um, what we can't do is take steps backwards. And so, that's what we did this year. So one of the things that we've talked about and Jody's going to shoot daggers at me for this one, I'm sure. We've talked about this for many years, and that's establishing metrics on the school side of things, too. Mm -hmm. And we've even talked about just, you know, not that being a completely independent process uh, because you have to take into account outcomes, and it's not just a fiduciary uh, uh, exercise. So I think maybe it would be helpful to develop that vision from the school side of things with some metrics that we can perform to, whether whatever it may be. Yep. And I don't want to throw things out there. To, no, no, to, that, to that's exactly what we're doing. That's the, right. the intent of realigning those positions to bring on the improvement strategists, was to bring in data, to develop data special, special to, specialists within our own existing staff and to build capacity so that we have, we are looking closer at those metrics because it isn't just about dollars for us, it's about student outcomes. So rather than just saying where we invest we see gains, we need to be able to really clearly articulate what those gains are with evidence. But we also need people to help build that culture. That's a huge cultural shift. And so we have, we have um, our, our Pleasant Hill principal who's working a bit on that and then also our improvement strategist at, the, strategist at the middle school who was an instructional coach who was reallocated to be in this role full time. Obviously there's a little slowness going on because we only have the two of them and they both are doing other jobs but that is their primary goal this year is to begin developing that improvement process, identifying those metrics and then building capacity among so, so maybe that's a good step forward is to at least you know have a, a, something come out of that process at the end that says here's a here's I mean we're doing it in finance it's going to be like, it's different I'm sure but mm -hmm. here's the parameters that we are governing towards long term and then that's and a in, in at least in my opinion which doesn't mean anything a more logical and reasonable explanation as to where funding is coming from and why we're choosing to, to spend resources in that area versus not. Well, and it's required under ESSA, which is the replacement for No Child Left Behind. You have to have these improvement cycles. So we're building it from the ground up right now. So one thing that happened, I believe, last year, Dr. Entwistle actually did come up with it with five or seven metrics that we all liked. Mm -hmm. Remember that whole exercise that we sat down and went through? So, um, I believe it's on it's the portal because I remember there was mm -hmm. a link to the CPAIR report. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but um, there were basically there was all kinds yes, of data that was given to us, and then we said there was uh, we kind of as a group said there are seven in there that we liked and wanted to consider. So maybe if we can look at those again, because he did provide at least last year, um, we've completely forgotten to look at it this year to see if, what we've done to improve well, those. Were, you know, and in, in, in fairness, those were all financial metrics too. Great. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So, so we, so that might be a good joint for you guys to bring here, but tie them back into your, your um, outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't obviously we're not in a position as counselors to talk about educational outcomes. It's a justification for spending the resources there, but certainly I think from our perspective we would be more interested. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself, but <coughs> we don't necessarily need to look at the educational outcomes. Just the here are the metric, the performance metrics, transportation. Yeah, we pulled out a few of those. We looked at pure people expenditure. We looked at administrative costs. Um, we looked at um, teacher salaries and what was the other one? And that one, it was the July letter to the letter that I had in the leader that also went home to all parents. Yeah, but maybe could it maybe as part of our dashboard that we have these as part, you know, at least on the annual summary, is that we include those if, they, if those are the ones that get called through and we determine that we want to keep them. Um, then they but should be part of the total dashboard that gets sent to us. One is on municipal services and one is on, which is as a whole, yep, right. and the other one is on educational services by itself. Yep. I think would be a, personally a good start because um, we haven't looked at any changes yep. in those uh, ratios this year. Yep. Um, so maybe just kind of a process check. So it sounds like we've kind of talked a little bit about the 
process and where we are. And anybody else have anything for suggestions? It sounds like there were some suggestions tonight about it. Some tweaks to the process going forward that I think that we just talked about was kind of a segue to the next one, which is really kind of the pros and cons of doing financial modeling, because it seems like to me the very thing you described about if we've got these things that are coming down the pike, and I mean, we're starting to try to take a look at the, on the municipal side, just trying to do some of that financial modeling, especially when you marry that with the debt. So as we have a public safety building and what that's going to do when that comes online to mm -hmm. debt service, I mean, the first year it's online, it's, it's a hit. Um, and so, so this part of the agenda item was just talk about, does it make sense for us try to put together sort of a comprehensive look at what it might look like over the next two to three years so we can understand how we balance those resources as a community. So that's, that was part of the other agenda item tonight, is, is whether it made sense to try starting that process. And I, I think what you just described is a good example of saying, okay, if we knew what it looked like for two or three years, we could say this is a year we're going to invest in mm -hmm. whatever one of those initiatives you got at first, or this is the year we need to invest in the public safety building or whatever it might be. And so yeah. what people feel about that process, we have we've talked about it a couple of years now as being something we wanted to move towards. So part of, part of the... We've decided as, as the town council side, we're going to try doing some of that. Um, I just wanted to kind of get some input from you if that made sense or didn't make sense or what your concerns would be and is there a way we could start forward? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I, I think obviously my concerns would be the cost risk benefit of putting that time and effort into creating a forecast when we know that the budget process in and of itself is a moving target and is very complex and our numbers in April are very different than our numbers in June which are very different than our numbers in August so um, I think about Kate as my my main resource yeah. in doing yeah. that and she's also responsible for HR for the entire school department we have 527 employees and she has two staff that support her in processing every single item that's purchased in the district and every single pay that gets processed in the district and all of the benefits. And so, I mean, her plate is extremely full and um, developing our budget in and of itself is a six to eight month process um, in a healthy year. So asking her to do that again in a really fictitious way is a concern of mine. Um, I did learn, Kate can speak more specifically to this, I did ask Kate to go back and um, create, they had done this case, they had done this before, the school mm -hmm. department, back in June 2012. Um, and I asked Kate to kind of pull together the numbers so I could see kind of where did we, what was the voter approved budget for FY13, so that would have been June 2012, um, then what was actually expended in FY 13 comparative to what was projected in June 2012 for FY14. This was the crazy year when um, Maine State Retirement was added it, added to the budget after the budget was approved. And so it it's a great case study for all the narratives. It's also the year um, in, F, in August 2013 when charter schools were added. And so Kate can, she's done a really nice analysis. This year and she It was a great, a great case study. So I think I would imagine much to be the same if we tried to project for the next two or three years. There's a lot of things changing in education. Um, I think we've really hit sort of a tipping point when you um, there's a lot of outside pressures like demanding that schools look different, particularly at high school, and wanting there to be more career technical opportunities and things like that. So I think it's really going to change the way education looks, not to mention all of the regionalization that's being um, asked of us um, by the, the, gov the governor and the Department of Ed right now. I just was in a meeting today where we were trying to figure out a way that we could possibly create a regional project 
just so that we don't lose state funding, but realizing that we're probably not going to get enough funding to really cover the cost of regionalizing this project. So again, trying to weigh the balance of what would we lose in subsidy versus what would this end up costing our taxpayers. And change next year no matter what anyway. Right. And you know, knowing that we kind of have like this lame duck situation, what really will end up happening. So there's a lot of moving parts. And I just say that to be a realist that we really have to think about um, what is the benefit. I, based on the evidence that I've observed this year, I'm super worried about putting projections out there because I'm nervous that it will be hard for people to understand the difference between a projection and a plan or an actual number. Um, and I, I don't say that to be like snarky or like snotty. It's just what I've observed. Um, and so again, I think about the time and effort that it'll take for the school department alone to be able to generate that type of information and you know to what end because it'll either be conservative and the number will look big or will be really optimistic and then the number may be different and I also worry about people voting no on FY19 because of what they think might happen in FY20 or FY21 based on our projections again that's just based on what I observed this year um, I think that if if there was a campaign to vote no on the third referendum, so the first two no's didn't go to waste. What wouldn't? What would the narrative be if we had projections that were high? Vote no now, so that you can vote no later. I don't know. That's my worry. My honest worry. <laughs> I'm just shaking my head because it's your first year as our superintendent, and and we're really excited for you to be here and to think of the fact that this is your first year and, and to sort of hear how you're, you're being polite and, and professional and lovely is so disheartening as <laughs> a, a parent and a, a person who spent a lot of time hiring you. Like, we did a really good job in hiring you and to know that it's probably very discouraging the atmosphere of the town that you are now in is crazy to me. It's, it doesn't just affect the number at the bottom of a page when people vote no. It affects the business next door, the local business owned by someone who lives here or um, is raising a family here or the people that you're trying to determine are awful and whatever. Like We all live here. This is a community, and so we need to figure out the culture. Like the, the whole numbers and, and trying to come up for two years, like, it would, in my opinion, in theory, it might sound like a great idea, but in my opinion, it's a waste of Kate's time. It's a it's a lose lose situation because, again, if she comes out and it looks crazy the year after next that's going to be the narrative and that's going to take over the conversation instead of the actual budget that's this coming year. If you go the other way, it's again a lose. So for me, it's just, it, 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 we have better use of Kate's time. Can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> um, you guys are great, thank you. Um, it sounds like I have a really hard job and I should go lie down and talk. You should. You should. <laughs> Every <laughs> month <laughs> probably should have had that. <laughs> I appreciate everything that's said. Obviously, I want to be conscious of my time and efforts. Um, I'm, I'm less worried about how much time it might take me to do a two-year projection if it has the right value. If it adds value to the conversation, if it helps us be planful, if it helps us make good decisions, like Peter's saying, if, you know, if this is a way that we can actually get somewhere that's more effective and more thoughtful, and um, healthy for our town. Right on, I'll do that, that's awesome. I, I would love to spend time doing that. But I, I do worry, as Julie says, that um, the way that a two-year projection would be perceived might be detrimental to the process. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes to, you know, if, if I do a projection the way that I really want to do, to be really careful and conservative, it's gonna be high. Because I'm going to I'm going to think about the things that could go wrong, and I'm going to estimate higher than I most likely believe things will come in. Um, 
And past experience tells us that when we estimate low, we get kicked in the chops. So um, as a, an accountant, I wouldn't do that. And, and so then you're back to the question of to what end. Does, does that actually help us to make a decision? So I go back to what our original goal was of setting 3%. Um, we started the conversation three years ago that you were, you were finance and I was finance. We got this similar table. The goal was reasonable and sustainable, predictable tax increases or, or tax rates. And we chose 3% as a, not as an arbitrary number. If I recall, we did a 10 year analysis and we looked at it and decided that 3% I think was, ended up being about the average over that 10 year process, but we wanted to eliminate that giant sawtooth impact of one year it's 8%, then it's zero, or then it's 4%, and then it's 1.5%. So I think it would really depend on the expectations of that forecasting. I think as a joint finance group, we could take a big number, the, the overall budget, and say, let's assume X percent per year, and we can decide what that percentage is. Just to give some kind of idea of general trending. And I think if we do that across the board with school and municipal, we're still going to have to make those decisions year in and year out of priorities. But I think it will accomplish two things. It will give people a reference point to say it's not going to be zero, but it's not going to be catastrophic either. So if we could, you know, maybe the discussion moving into next year as we decide, you know, we talk about what that percentage uh, increase is expected overall in expenditures, just in general terms, not specific programming, but just if it's a $46 million budget and we assume a 3.5% increase or a 2% or a 1% increase, we're going to assume it's going to be around here and that's the basis for the starting of the discussion. Because again, it's still going to end up being if, if the fire department has an immediate need and we've got one pie, we're still going to have to decide how to slice that pie up. And, and we get to decide how big the slices are. I think what people are concerned with is, how big is this pie going to be? So I, I think we can, maybe we could accomplish what we need with, a, with, with not a Herculean effort, but, but maybe something a little more broader where we don't need in-depth analysis of each line item, mm -hmm. but we take a bigger snapshot and go, okay, we expect you know, we maybe start with a big picture. The overall budget is going to be X. Then we look at transport. Then we can start shifting it down into the smaller segments. And I think that'd be the intent of doing some forecasts. I mean, on the on the on the school side, probably what eighty percent of the budget's contractual wages and salaries. Which there may be some changes in that, but it's it's kind of a quantifiable number in the short term. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually maybe. the number you gave me gave us the other day about the number of changes that happened. Thirty-five. But did it change the overall number? Yeah, because if you're going from a single so subscriber to a family subscriber yeah. subscription, that's but, a huge swing for just one person. But, but I think conceptually that the concept becomes and kind of building on is if we, so for instance, we know that if the public safety building passes this fall, we know we can reasonably predict the year that that comes online, there's going to be a pretty significant hit to the budget because we have the debt service that will come online. If that same, if we knew at that same year that we're going to have to have, you mentioned something, I think the initial CDC or something CBS. was, CDS, yeah, was yeah. going to be another seven figure hit. The, the reason to do some of that financial planning would be to say, geez, can we stage some of these things? If we have to make it, you know, an investment in public safety, we know that's going to be whatever that year is. That's what I think is kind of being asked for. Is there a way that we can at least start to look at look out into the future and try to even out that 3% works overall, but as we've found the last couple of years, there can be blips to that. So if there are going to be some blips, can we tell when they're coming? And I think more importantly, if we want to change the culture, I think for some, that's an important effort for us to undertake to say, yeah, we're going to look at it. And I think just like we do on the tax rate where we say, here's the low range, here's the high range, the numbers will probably be somewhere in between. I mean, I think that's a reasonable way to do forecasting. So Peter, I've got a question to ask. What, 
so I understand what's driving the conversation. It's a special interest group that wants it. No, I don't. The question I have is, what? Well, I can tell you that this wasn't really a conversation until it got brought up by a special interest group. No, no. I mean, I, I, I disagree. So we, I mean, we talked about this as a finance committee as one of our goals was trying to do some financial modeling. Yeah. I mean, it was on your agenda when you were a finance chair. So this isn't a new conversation. Financial modeling is different than forecasting. Okay, how? I mean, what do you mean? Because the financial model that we've been talking about, that I started with, is the dashboard approach that we've been talking about. It's not about forecasting out expenses. It was not about, that was a different conversation that we had. I'm, so what I want to take this to is, what are we going to use it for? What are we going to do? Because it should drive policy, and it should drive the talk about the value of our community and the value of our programs. So what we've talked about up to this point is about doing a forecasting to appease others that want information. No, no, I, I just described that. But how are we going to use it for? I just, here's, here's a situation. So if, if Julie just described she has two or three major expense points coming down the road, we know if the public safety building pass that that's going to be a blip that year. Right, but the challenge though, Peter, is, is that um, we, with some things we can control, like when we put the public safety out to bond, right. if CDS comes through next year, that's a mandate. That's, that's something that we can't choose to defer that. You see what I mean? We, we, we're forced no, no, to react but, to it. Now. But, but Julie also described some other programs we'd like to invest in to move us forward. So to get to Sean's point about how we could start using some of this information, and we have, you know, we have... So I agree with you about the, uh, about the public safety buildings. We made that decision. So in a forecast, of course you would include it because you want to know what the impact of the budget is going to be once you start paying. We've already made that decision and committed to it. However, the items that we're talking about that could be anywhere within the budget. It's not just about the schools. It could also be things. So revenue sharing. Sure. It could be mandates that are coming later that we don't because it's a guess. We don't know whether or not they're really coming. Why would why would we do a forecast that would include um, funding of CDS when we don't know whether or not that's real? Or how much is it? Let's. I mean, I, the example I'm using. Yeah. If Julie has some things, forget the mandates. Yeah. If she's she just said she. She is looking forward and kind of coming up with a plan how we can continue to invest in the schools to move them forward. And we know we have public safety. We know we have some other things. You know, if we at least had that on a piece of paper, we could. You ask, what could we do together? We could start saying, okay, here's a way we think we could start phasing these things in, so it's not going to hit a blip in one year so when we go into the. That's that's the value of forecast. But I think we're Here's the question. doing that here already. Can I ask one question though, Chris? Because I like that approach. I like the idea of looking at it truly as one town and saying sometimes one department's going to have greater needs than others. But how does that correct the issue that we have in this community that whatever the highest number is, that's going to be the focal point? It, it, and it and so when when those mandates do come, because be sure they're coming, and I won't have control over them, it will make my budget higher than I would want it to be because they will be brand new things. Of course I will look for how can I reallocate, how can we realign resources, how can we, you know, I'll be looking for every possible um, opportunity out there to make it as manageable for our community as we can, but there still will be this idea that one part of the budget might have to be heavier than others in certain years, in certain fiscal years. Um, but at the end of the day, the only place people are going to be able to vote is on the school budget. And so it's going to be say, we're, people are going to vote no, maybe because they think the police department budget's too high or some other, you know, public works is too high based on our needs, based on our financial forecasting, but the only place they get to come and say no thank you is on the school budget, and then the town council is going to say, guess you got to reduce your budget, guess you got to reduce your budget, because that, so I don't, I don't really see how that solves the right problem, which is that we need to build trust in our community that we are going, we have their best interest in mind. I have no other purpose for being here. But it's interesting, this year we tested that. We did the shared mm -hmm. approach. We took, uh, we took, uh, proportional cuts and yeah, only to be criticized for mm -hmm. taking right. money from the town. I mean, it, um, but I, but I don't think that's that my year, worry. One year, one year does not. A, well, first of all, one year does not a trend make. Number one and number two, I do think that it's a, it is a cultural philosophical shift of the governing bodies. I think we're trying to, and I think that's going to take time. And I think, I, I mean, you're always again. I, I, I firmly believe that there's ten percent on each side that aren't going to like no matter anything that we do, one way or another. It's the 80% in the middle that we've got to focus on, and, and it's, it's finding a way to have reasonable discussions with reasonable people. 
And I do think that, I mean, I, I, I agree with Peter that we have to have some, it's the old sailor's analogy. If you don't know what port you're sailing to, no wind is favorable. So you've got to at least have some kind of general target down there. Now, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to handcuff either this group or future governing bodies that says you must do it this way. But I think, I think it, that it could go to gaining some trust if we put some general ideas out there, kind of to 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 what we're seeing before about a range. I don't think it has to be a detail analysis, but I, I think it has to be a little bit meaningful than greater than 1% and less than 15. Right. You know, I think it has to be some reasonable target with the understanding and the caveat and the collective discussion has to be, these are guidelines. Guidelines are just that, guidelines. It's not policy, it's not a mandate. When we say 3% or less, it doesn't mean that 3% is the hard, it's the hard stop. You know, it means that those are the guidelines we look at and there could be and will be every year extenuating circumstances that force us as a governing body to evaluate our situation and react to it and try and do what's in the best interest of the town. And keep, keep in mind that 3% wasn't just plucked out of the air. It wasn't like everyone right. said, well, that sounds about right. Uh, we did some fairly detailed analysis that took into account uh, the sort of fixed costs that the school's work, working under and understanding what are their gross expenditures look like year over year. So it assumes some things on that side, it, it assumes some things on the town side, it then on top of that layered in what the historical increase in valuation, and it provided just a little bit, two or three hundred thousand dollars for new investment. Didn't define where it was, but it, it, it provided for just a little bit of money, and um, three out of the four years we've met it. And that was intended to provide everyone some into the future certainty. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to be, but have comfort that it's going to be somewhere around this number. And so I, I, I mean, I think so. I feel like we're already doing that. I guess that's my point. To underscore a point that Julie made, though. Maybe we should revisit that goal with more community input, and maybe that's part of the disconnect that that three percent is um, isn't reasonable to all. Yeah. Well, but it so was. Peter, Peter, just, well, I'm not against forecasts. Sure. I have reservations about how we do the forecast, what's included in the forecast, and, the, and how it's then going to be. So okay. I'm in favor of the forecasting piece or budgeting, if that's what you want to know, whatever you want to call it, yeah. whether it's two years. Um, I, I'm concerned about the resource requirements because just looking at, you know, as the superintendent said, look at today's process and now we're going to complicate that by adding something completely new in which the first process isn't well understood or it's that conflict with the majority of people or those people that are actually paying attention to it. So I think you have to fix the first problem before you can start the second. So because that's going to create its own problems. So Whether we like it or not, it's going, to, it's going to create conflict, it's going to create criticism, it's going to create expectations, and all these other things that are emotional as well. So I'm just reserved about how we get to that point and then yeah. what it is used for because we're doing a lot of metrics, we're doing a lot of benchmark, we're doing a yeah, lot yeah. of math, but we're not having the conversation about what we want in the community. Yeah. Maybe the horse trading is uh, if we pass the budget on the first time, that'll free up staff. To give them a little bit of time to work on projections for the future because, in essence, we're starting the budget process next week, two weeks from now? Last Thursday. Last Thursday. There you go. So, I mean, you know, I, it, it's, it's, it's just a matter of resource allocation, really. I would say one more thing about the process, and it, it, I think you guys touched on it. Um, it really depends on what parameters you set. Yeah. If um, you looked back at what we did in 2012, we actually had a whole page of here are the assumptions that we made on wages and benefits, here are the assumptions that we're making on energy and utilities, here are the assumptions that we're making on debt service, here are the assumptions that we're making on these big cost drivers that we always come out and talk about when we start the budget process in the beginning of each cycle. Um, and yes, they will be even more big and uncertain two years old than they would a year old, um, but it would be very important to know to what degree we want to be accurate, or as accurate as we can, and then how do we communicate what our assumptions right. have been right. to get so, there. But so it, I, I mean, could, well, sorry, could, could be it as simple as being a 10-year trending average, or, or a, you know, a, 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 some, some realistic, articulate statistical analysis that basically says you throw out the high, throw out the low, you do your average for 10. Again, just as a benchmark, not not as something that I certainly would not be comfortable saying. You know, you're going to run this analysis, and it's it's 1.34579 percent percent. So that's what we're going to stick to every single year moving forward. 
I would so. feel most comfortable starting that in FY20, like once we can get through this leveling out of being minimal receiver and not having the massive amounts of fund balance that we've been sure. able to use the last couple of years, because I think that, I mean, it, it's going to be big work to to get a reasonable budget to our voters in FY19. I think we all realize that. You don't have to be that good at math to figure that one out. Um, and so I think we need FY20 to be a baseline year. And then it feels like, okay, now we could probably begin to do that. But right now, if you look back at just the work that has been done in the school budget over the last five years, it's kind of all over the place with various funding sources and this decline in state subsidy, but then kind of a big dip, but having this fund balance to add to counter that, so I just. Well, how do you how do you foresee how do you foresee next year being any different if CDS rolls in and you've got all these other mandates that show up? It's just another it's a it's fund another year with reductions with a different label. on I'm just saying fund balance fund alone. alone is, the two I mean we're starting the year with a 2.3 million dollar gap to fill. So I'm I'm praying for lots of retirements and lots of new people that want to come work in Scarborough despite our. But, 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 but in some ways, does, doesn't that inform the work that Sean's question is, how does it benefit us? But doesn't that start to inform if we started to just do quick math for next year? I mean, everybody's saying there's been a lot of numbers thrown out, but if we knew what sort of the numbers looked like, well, we that do. gives this body of, to, what are we going to do about that? Well, we do know what the numbers are going to look like. And we, what am I going to do about it? I'm trying to tap into as many creative funding sources as I possibly can without you know, bringing on new projects. So that's why I'm having these regionalization com conversations and weighing, like, what's the cost risk benefit of me even engaging in this since we're already minimum receivers that I can't go any lower in terms of state funding? Yeah. So do I take on the risk of joining a regional project and then possibly costing the district more money because we don't know if the grant money is going to match the actual cost of doing something like this. But, but I guess, yeah, but I guess my point was just is, as a joint finance committee meeting, if we started looking at those numbers right now, then that gives, to answer Sean's question about what can we do in the numbers, that allows us to start saying as a town, what are we going to do with all the resources we have to meet the needs? So I think that's... No, I, I, I think that's premature, and I think it's premature because I think we're falling into that pit again, of that trap again of saying, if we put inaccurate numbers out there, not intentionally, but just because we don't have the data, if we, I mean, it's, 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 it's a guess, right? I mean, that's the thing. And, and what, makes, what makes our guess good or bad? Any better than the other side. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, all I'm saying is for our, our, yeah. our work, yeah. we may need extra time this year in the budget process to try to make, I think we got some tough choices. So there, there's two parts to the question here is what do we want to do as a group and we come back to that as a joint that's kind of the last agenda item how do we want to work together going for as a joint finance committee meeting the things we want to work on and then but going back to this do we want to table this for a conversation further do it sounds like there's some interest but some concerns one thing you might be able to do without being putting too far a point on anything doing forecasting is and i think we do this to some extent is having just a general open conversation around what's ahead and yeah. we might be able to quantify some of that but at least getting them on the table that there's a bunch of things looming or maybe some good stuff coming for that matter but uh just a general conversation around what's the outlook as opposed to getting too precise. I think that's where many of us practitioners are getting hung up on and I think that the preciseness of that analysis. Right. First, um, that should be a conversation for the full boards um, so that everyone has a clear understanding of what that is, that there aren't second questions coming in after the fact. So if we do do that, which I agree with, I think it needs to be all seven school board and all seven town councilors. The second piece of that, Peter, for, for you know, my input is that I think that given the comments from the superintendent on the resource load and other pieces, I think that the very least what we can do, if we do want to move forward with future forecasting, starting in the year that the superintendent recommended given the balancing act, is that we begin a conversation about what do we want to include and what are the parameters of the forecast. Because this could be the time that we talk about that and then we're prepared in the next cycle or later to begin looking at preliminary numbers, not necessarily, you know, 
Well, isn't that a metrics discussion? I mean, that really is looking at, is that what you mean by looking at what, what number like? Yeah, so as an example, the, the very, I mean, there's, there's a simple approach where you just simply take every year and you times every cost and uh, by 3%. An average, right? Because that's the average, that's the goal. I mean, that's, right. very, that's very simple. There's no thought to that right. other than what is your overall tax rate. Right, but that, right. right. and that, that was my suggestion is to keep it that simple. Just to say it gives us a baseline, at least it's, it's and gives us, maybe gives us a little time to, to do the, the in-depth metric analysis. So once you get their goals, the metrics are going to fall in line with that, I, I would think, right? Or no? Yeah. yeah. Right, and then we, and then, so then maybe the, 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 then, the, then the discussion, to your point, becomes what metrics are we going to incorporate in the, in, instead of a dashboard, maybe it's a cockpit now. <laughs> we get screens all over the place, right? <laughs> right? So, you know? well, so my point on the forecasting piece is that, so that's a simple approach where you just look at the tax rate. The other approach is, and that might be the first point that we look at just to be comfortable with it. The next approach is then looking at what are our priorities and what are our inve program investments. So, you know, two years is going to be, I mean, of course you can include the public safety in the first year because we know, we put it out to the voters, we want it to pass, at least the council said it um, to some extent. Um, but then you start talking about what's going to be in year two because we need a conversation about facilities. What are our priorities for year number two, which drives the whole forecast. So there's, other, I think there's other, well, I guess um, there are variables that go into the forecast that need to be discussed and prioritized before you can create the forecast. Mm -hmm. Facilities is one of them. Program right. investments, and now when I say program investments, it's across the board. And I'm not necessarily looking at it from a school perspective because I cherish the fact that there are seven more knowledgeable and expert opinion that's looking at where those resources should go. And I think that those benchmark metrics that, we, that were selected last year becomes the basis of, of their kind of conversation of why they need more than 3% or less than 3%. You see, and, but then Tom can take into consideration the fire and police department, which has had an investment um, kind of plan around a number of employees. So you see what I'm saying? Because that, that will change. I'm just saying that I mean, we take the time to establish the beginning parameters and then where we want to take it on a timeline basis. So it, sound, it, it sounds like we maybe the first general session together should be the goals planning and that should be a joint workshop. And then we go back to doing our individual meetings to, to cite them things out. It might out be a good time to check in that does this committee structure work to have everyone, and you probably should wait till you have your new council, new board seated to say does the committee system work. Part of it is deferring the workload but also the decision making and not entirely but the, the recommendations at the end of this two or three months pr process have a lot of different factors associated and you pull one little piece out, the whole thing could fall apart. So so to that point, do we want to try and then spend the next month or two trying to come up with a, some form of, of policy that we're both going to adopt to keep the process moving? Or are we happy with where we're at and just kind of let it come through next year as whatever comes through? So I, I, I didn't follow the picture about the policy. Well, I think right now we're, 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 there's nothing there's nothing really set in stone that requires us to get together and have these discussions, right? There's no. I don't think we need to, though, do we? I, 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 I don't know. know. I, well, I, what's going to? Given how close we are to the next budget cycle, yeah, I think that we need to begin to focus on that budget cycle and the changes that we want to make to the process. Mm -hmm. That behind the scenes or maybe ancillary to that conversation is that we also continue discussing the parameters of the future forecasting so that at the end of this budget we know what our parameters are and then we can start hopefully with a passage early. We can then focus on a kind of a forecast process next April. Right. My only my only thought was that, that there could be a, a significantly change significant change in the council makeup as well as yeah. the school board makeup. So does this process, right now, I think the process is more of a, I don't say voluntary, but it's kind of a, it's not really, it's I a best practice kind to, of thing. I right? think we yeah. need to, in my opinion, I think this process needs to continue. I think we've, we've seen improvements along the way, and I feel like we're sort of trying to shift too many things at once mm -hmm. without perfecting or, or really improving some of the things that we implemented. I think over the last year, We've made huge strides, and I think focusing on those and enhancing those in a way that continues to move us forward is important before right. we totally just throw our hands up. And no, no, and that's why I was asking: Do we want to take this, take the opportunity in the next couple? If we're going to wait and not really get into forecasting until the next couple, until after November, 
do, do we want to, as individual bodies or something, try and consolidate the work that we've done so that future makeups or future groups coming together will say, okay, yeah, our policy is you meet with the, you know, the joint finance committees meet three times a year or whatever it comes up to. So it's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Every so, other week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just throwing out there. I'm not suggesting we do it or not. I'm just saying do, do we want to try and, and, and solidify some I of the process now or do we want to just keep it as a, as a best practices kind of thing and with the possibility that it could change, obviously. Do you want me to tell you to give my line about policy that I do every single meeting? I've probably heard it several times, but it might make it. Yeah. It's not a policy. It doesn't belong in a policy manual. Policies are enforceable by law and are should be very minimal and um, recommended from German and Woodsum and MSMA is required recommended policies only so that the book is, uh, everyone can be accountable for what is in the book, and if we just add situational policies, then it becomes the monster that we currently have, which is this tall when you have it all printed out. I wasn't thinking situational, I think more process, but that's all right. So maybe it's a procedure, that's what I'm saying. It's more like a, it's like a norm. So that's fine. Yes. Exactly, not not a policy. So, so I guess in the interest of time, do, do we want to meet again before the elections, or? Put it on hold and reconvene afterwards. And I'm looking for uh, I feel like putting it on hold only delays the process. Mm -hmm. Like okay. the majority of us are still here, okay. and so like let's just keep working. If we, you know what okay. I mean? Like I feel like if we, okay, the budget cycle is over. Let's okay. wait till the budget cycle. Everybody else okay with that? So we'll I feel like we're just going to find some time in October. Keep working. That's the best way to cement a norm is to keep working. Yeah, so yeah. fine. Yeah. We'll find it. We'll find a date. I love seeing you all. all so we'll find we'll find a date in October. Yeah. yeah. As part of that, I'd love to check in on some of the nuts and bolts in terms of uh, the budget format um, in the budget forum. We haven't talked about whether that's worth doing again. Those are sorts of things that I'm starting to think about for next year. Right? Yeah. Right. Meeting okay. and planning. I have okay. lots of ideas about that. Can I like a to work with Sean Bushway? We did a really, I think, worked really well and got the public safety building website really user friendly and more far more intuitive. The budget portal, as much as all the information yes. is there, mm -hmm. it is yes. extremely yeah. challenging to find. Yeah. So if I could have your blessing to work yes. with Sean, I would like to take care of that. Oh, make, make it much that's easier. Like Christmas in yeah. yeah. October. In order to continue the conversation around um, the norms and the process and things that we've done, as far as to kind of put that into writing so that the next group okay. um, can understand that um, I think it would be a blessing if both chairs of the finance committee created a procedure document that outlines that information. And, uh, Do you have, know? <laughs> <laughs> Just when you thought oh, it had enough. <laughs> no, that's Remember how you said you so. wanted to keep going? Yeah, like, <laughs> let's just keep going. So, yeah. well, it can just be a bulletized. It doesn't yeah, need yeah, to be yeah. fully fleshed out. Yeah, it's okay. kind of an outline. Yeah. Of, I, I would just say that as I'm working on the budget building for FY19, it's much easier for me to take the documents that I'm working with and to add information or notes or ideas about the coming years as I'm in the process. So if we do go into conversations about what parameters for long-range yeah, forecasting you could look would look like, I would really be interested in having those conversations so is there another municipality who does this that we could look to for a model? I don't know. Is there any other municipality that has the same problems? I'm not aware of any problems to sort of effort forward. Um, Farmington not. still doesn't have a budget. But their, their form of government is different. They have like the town meeting style yeah. first, and then they do the ballot. Are they, they an RSU or are they a uh, yes. yes. Are they RC9? Yeah. But it's, so they still don't have a budget, but their process is very different from ours. I mean, outside the state, I mean, they're under state. Ohio mandates that it's done. So. Yeah, but that's different joint, laws. Different different joint. Joint. But it's, it, it is, but I mean. But I think just even it. seeing, I'd love to just see to what level of detail do they articulate it. Not I mean, a, a community member gave us an example of his idea of what a budget forecast could look like, but it's super general, and it's just assuming a 3% increase, and I think we could do that, right, and, right. but that wouldn't be accurate, because even this year, we didn't have a 3% increase in expenditures. So it's, it goes back to that question, to what end? Because to just be super general, then it's not really helpful. 
But I like the idea of maybe thinking bigger about investments that we may need to make or that we see coming down the pike and might not be able to put exact dollars to it, but we know that, you know, that's basically what we do in the budget process in the school department. That's when, we, when you see our level services, our student-centered, and then our mission critical, I'm just wondering if we should rename our student-centered to be like long-range plan because that's really what it is. We basically go through that and say, what's high, what's mid, what's low priority, what can we do this year? Obviously the things in the high priority, what do we have to think about for next year or the year after? I mean, we do do that. It's very, very detailed. It's multiple meetings um, with a lot of experts at the table. But I think, I think again, it gets back to the, I, I would agree it's a trust issue. You know, we, our processes aren't, aren't, I don't see them as being flawed. Mm -hmm. So to, to build, to, to regain trust, I think, like I said, we have to have, I'm not a fan of detail, a detailed budget analysis, but I think we need to at least give some general direction. And I'm, I'm perfectly content with just taking the total budget and multiplying it by a factor of X and saying, here's our range, this is just what we're looking at, because ultimately you're going to decide the details of what's behind it, but we just need to have some idea where John Q. Public with a minimal you know, math skills can go, it was this this year, and we think it's going to be this much in a couple of years. But How I about that? I don't think that that gets at, the, I don't think that gets at the emotion piece. I don't think that tells the story. I think people, people buy what you do, not people buy why you do it, right? Whatever that Simon said thing is. Like helping people understand why we're making these investments is more important than just what the number's gonna be. Uh, but that's my, but that, that is, again, my point is to say, at, at some point, we're making these investments because we're gonna tie it into your metrics and your, your outcomes. So we're gonna say, if your goal is to have uh, X amount of proficiency in a certain, let's say foreign language, okay? Mm -hmm. If you wanna have X proficiency by a certain time, you're gonna say, our goal, it, whether it's a mandate, it's one thing, but if our goal is to say have proficiency to a certain level in in uh, by a graduating senior by in three years, mm -hmm. okay, then we can say, okay, that's the goal. What does the investment look like to get to that goal? And that's what. So the metric is proficiency in foreign language. Then we come back around and circle around the discussion and say, what's the investment to get to that goal, right? And if the goal is a percentile, let's say it's 85% or 90% proficient, whatever that number is, however you determine that. Mm -hmm. Then we say, okay, if we're not going to hit that level, um, if we invest X amount, you know, what happens to that proficiency level? We'd right. love to have 100%. But I think you're overcomplicating it. I, I cannot believe that the average voter knows or cares about that, frankly. No, and I, so, right. I, I've got to believe in most communities there is a call it blind faith or trust or whatever you call yes. it, they show up and they vote to support the schools. This is the, the only schools. town that I've ever read about in Maine, including there are some, a lot of dysfunctional other towns, all remain nameless that um, not keep them anonymous, but that have dysfunction among their own boards and with their town councils and their RSUs or whatever. And There's something budgets. different about functions. Scarborough where people have philosophical objections to spending in the school department that no one ever would go through public works budget I'm not so sure. Maybe and have a philosophical run. objection to that or public safety. Country. Can we it's, pilot it's voting so on um, a different it's part of the cool. budget for a year <laughs> just to see what would happen? Yes, no. <laughs> what about the 12,000 people that are registered to vote that didn't vote? That's, that's exactly like those the, point, the right. like, So if, if we, we know that the numbers of people that voted no stayed fairly constant, so how like, could some time be spent about how do we get even a thousand more of those 12,000 that didn't vote out to vote with the idea that very likely they are going to be more trusting. Because if they didn't vote, right. they probably kind of trust us so, to make good decisions. So yeah, how yeah. do you get 12,000 registered voters who took the time to register to vote, well, I, but didn't take the time to vote? So I if the new iPhone can recognize your face, why can't you start voting like <laughs> That's another issue. But, but we talked about that, about taking the, the road show off, right? And going on the road yeah. and, and, you know, time to advocate for it. So maybe that's maybe that's a better time spent than sitting here trying to tweak crosses. Over the last yeah. couple of years, one of the things that I've noticed is that more and more time is spent on the negative mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. with the group. The conversation. And it's, gone, it's increased more and more. And um, how so do we negative of this on the, no, 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 just the, the narrative as a whole? The trying to reactionary to the comments. The emails that come in are getting longer and more. 
you know, um, and then try to answer them right away. And how do we change that so that you're not being so reactionary to those people and start focusing on maybe a roadshow that is positive in getting out to those? Because I do well, that's see the, the That's the next discussion. Is there a way to involve more right. people in the process right. so they don't ask those questions? So you get well, them. But my only, my only, and my only making point. sure that our school board meetings and our town council meetings don't become a place for us just to reinforce that negative narrative because we've all done that this year. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. again, and I think part of no, the, that was, <laughs> that was my whole point of trying to keep it simple with a goal in mind because, you know, uh, I, what I've, found my experience being on the school board was is I didn't speak education and it's a very complex language in and of itself and I think part of that was lost in trans can be lost in translation easily when we start talking about the more complex issues which is why I think if we just say from a again a, just a directional point we're going to keep things within a certain range I think you know 80% of the people in the middle are going to go, okay, that's reasonable. I don't think they're going to dig into the, the details of it. We can do that when we're talking about what we're going to use the data for. We can use those metrics internally for policy decisions, not necessarily for out in the public to convince them to vote yes. But I think they also want to hear the story. You remember something if there's a story with it, not, oh, it's a 3% increase potentially or whatever the number is, but the roadshow being the story. Mm -hmm. you're, you're asking your questions. You're getting feedback. You're hearing... What's happening in You're the developing schools. trust. You're developing trust. There's a, yes. But so part can, of that trust has to be here are our numbers. Uh, I'm just saying. So there's still a lot of passion and energy, um, but it's also a quarter of eight. Um, so we've decided, um, so some of the to-dos will be we will, Joey and I will look for a meeting date in October. Um, we kind of have an assigned task to come up with some procedure document, whatever. Procedure. <laughs> whatever Sean was talking what, about. We have some. Some yeah. uh, we'll norms, come up with an agenda for norms, norms. norms yeah, yes. and we'll come up. That work's been done. We can dust that yeah, off so yeah. use that as a starting point. Yeah. 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 And with that, anybody else got anything? Carding? No, he doesn't. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.